Okay. So, uh, yes, this is automating your browser and desktop apps. You can follow along with the slides by downloading them from bit.ly slash automate talk. Um, yeah, so, hi, I'm Al. It's great to be back in Austin. I actually grew up in Texas and I went to UT Austin. So even though I've lived for the last decade in San Francisco, my heart and my soul will be in Austin. Uh, I'll take this off with a slightly controversial opinion. I like programming. Uh, there are several things I like about programming. Mostly that it requires a keen attention to detail. Uh, and I like programming so much that I want to teach other people to program. So I wrote a programming book. Uh, it's called Automate the Boring Stuff with Python. And it's available under a Creative Commons license, so you can read it for free at automatetheboringstuff.com. And I really encourage you to use Creative Commons as a license to make the work freely available. It has a lot of advantages. The main advantage I found is that uh, having it online, I can use analytics to look at what people are paying attention to and which chapters are the most read. And so the chapters on web scraping and GUI automation are the most popular chapters in this book. So that's what this presentation is about. So, uh, web scraping. Um, yeah, the internet is kind of a big deal. Uh, a lot of times, you know, when you're doing work on your computer, what you really are doing is work on the internet. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a conference where the Wi-Fi at the venue has gone down. Uh, you have about 10 minutes before people start resorting to cannibalism. <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's that important, and so when we start writing programs that can go onto websites and then start gathering information for us. Um, that's, that's a really useful skill to have. So, uh, unfortunately though, it also kind of requires all this technical knowledge to have about networking protocols and connectivity issues and TCP handshakes and whatever. Uh, but I have all those details on this next slide right here. Oh, well, okay. Fortunately though, you don't actually have to know any of that information. Uh, there's a module called Selenium. It's uh, a module that uh, will launch a browser that you can programmatically control. So if you have to write automated tests for your web app and you don't want to just download the HTML and then run beautiful soup on it or some other parser, you actually want it to run as it would for a user, running all the JavaScript on the page and uh, setting up all that state. Selenium is great. Um, you it's, it's really simple to install. So just hit install Selenium. Selenium? Selenium? I probably should have figured that out for certain before this talk. Um, but the first time I heard about this, uh, my company's uh, QA department was uh, using it. I heard about this and I was like, oh wow, that sounds great, but it also sounds really complicated. Uh, it's actually really dead simple. I can fit it into a 45 minute presentation along with a talk on GUI automation. Uh, there's really only about half a dozen things that you need to know, and those are all on this slide. Hey, that worked. So, I mean, it's not that complicated. This is a whole bunch of wallet text. Go ahead and ignore that. Um, but using Selenium, it's really simple. You import the module, just like any other module. Uh, you call this Firefox function, and this will actually launch an instance of Firefox on your computer. You will see the window appear and everything. And that gives you a browser object. You can call this get method to just send it to a website. And then you can use CSS selectors to find some particular HTML element on that web page, kind of like you know, a link or a checkbox, and you can then call the click method to click on that link or checkbox. And then when you're done, you just call the quit method and the browser goes away, and you can continue on doing whatever you want. So, that's the entire talk. Thank you very much for coming out. There will be no questions. Uh, so, that's, this is a whole bunch of telling, and I should be showing. So, I'm going to do something that is incredibly ill-advised, and that is a live demo. Yes, alt tabbing out of PowerPoint and running idle. Anything can go wrong. Everything will go wrong. Live demo. Okay, so also I just wanted to show that it is possible to keep all of the sel uh, Selenium stuff inside your head at the same time. So let's go ahead and import this module. So from Selenium, import web driver. Uh, so first bit of weirdness about Selenium that you should know is that you actually have to do this exact same uh, syntax. You have to type from Selenium import web driver. You can't just have import Selenium or anything like that. A weird little thing that's uh, about Selenium that you should be aware of. Uh, so next, let's go ahead and create that browser. 
So Firefox works out uh, right out of the package. If you want to have Chrome or Safari or something else, you can uh, there's a, a little bit of setup. But this will actually go ahead and launch Firefox, and you can see it appear on the screen. So I'm going to have this off to the side. And we'll just call that get method to send it to a website. And I kind of want to plug my book some more, so we'll just go to automatedboardstuff.com. And you can see now I have programmatic control. I'm controlling the browser from a Python script. So this is really nice. Yep, that's the website. And you know, if you're setting up an automated test, you'll have to go through and figure out what exactly your test should click on and uh, where it can expect to find that. So let's just do that here. I'm going to have to get an element object, so some HTML element from that page, by calling. This is the next bit of weirdness for Selenium. They have a really long method name. Find element by CSS selector. Like when they were handing out words to use in method names, I think this method was at the front of the line said, yes, I'll take them all. Uh, so kind of verbose, but uh, it works. Um, and then you just add in the uh, CSS selector. So if you use CSS, you might be familiar with this, or if you've used uh, something like Beautiful Soup. Um, but it can be, uh, it's a, a selector is kind of like a regular expression for HTML. It allows you to specify some particular part of that HTML document or that web page. Um, and you could learn all the syntax for that to be able to write it yourself, or you can cheat by using the browser to calculate that for you. I'm gonna click on this introduction link. So I wanna get the selector for that, so I'll just right click on it and select inspect element. That'll open up the browser tools Every modern browser has some form of developer tools. And where did it go? There we go. So you can see it. Here's the HTML for this column. And now I just want the uh, selector for this particular link. So I'm going to right click on that and select copy unique selector. So in various browsers, this might be copy CSS selector or copy CSS path or something, but all browsers have something like this. So we can just copy that, paste it in there. Uh, this selector is really particular. It'll match this uh, one link uniquely, but you can also have more general selectors to match several different elements. So there, that gives us uh, this element object. And then if we want so we need to click on that. We just call the click method. You see now we've clicked on that introduction part right there. So, so that's pretty handy. Um, find element by CSS selector is the method that you'll use about 80% of the time. There's also find elements, plural. So if you specify a general selector that matches several different elements, and it'll return a list of all the matching elements. There's also find element by uh, link text, find element by ID, but find element by CSS selector is the most useful one. So there, and then there was the, once you have that element object, you can click on things. You can also send keyboard keys. So if it's uh, the element for a text field, you can type something in. Let me just push my live demo luck even further. <laughs> So let's say you know, I figured out the selector for that and clicked on that. And now I want to run some automated test by entering something into the search field. I'll just copy unique selector again. Copy this, search element. And yeah, so these CSS selectors are really massively huge all the time. Oh, except for this one. <laughs> I can just send it some keys. Uh, I'll just, uh, I want to search for the word Sophie. And that just types it right in there. And then to submit this uh, search field, you know, you could have a new line character that simulates pressing enter, or you can find the selector for a submit button. But uh, Selenium has a nice little feature where if you have the element for some uh, element inside of an HTML form, you can invoke that form's submit. Uh, action just by calling it submit on any element inside of that. So that submits this search, and now here are all the uh, WordPress search results. 
from that. So Zofie is the name of my cat, uh, and I have a photo of her that features prominently in the image manipulation chapter of this book. Aww. She's kind of chubby, but the camera adds 10 pounds, and that's a lot for a cat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, I was giving a presentation. I'll just close the distracting photo of a cat. Okay. So, I mean, this is fine for you know, keyboard keys are easy to represent as single letters of a string, but say if you wanted to press the page down button or the escape button or the F1 button, um, here's another wall of text I don't actually expect you to read. Uh, Selenium has uh, constants that you can use for those special keys, such as saying keys.down for the down arrow and keys.home. They're all inside this one module, which has an unfortunately verbose name. Um, Let's see if I can actually remember it. From selenium.webdriver, I don't remember, uh, webdriver.common.keys, import, keys with a capital K. You have to get all this right. So yeah, just have a handy little cheat sheet, uh, cheat sheet off to the side. And then uh, that keys uh, contains all of the names for the special keyboard characters that you might want to use. So, I mean, yeah, um, this, this name, when, when Python has this Zen of Python poem that says flat is better than nested, this is what they mean. Don't have a name like selenium.webdriver.common.keys uh, inside the code that you write. Yeah, I have to like shrink it down so much that nobody can actually even read it uh, just to fit it all on one line. Um, but yeah, so that's, you know, clicking on things, typing into forms, that's basically what most web surfing is, and that's all your uh, automated scripts will have to do. Uh, but you can also not only interact with the things inside the browser, but you can also control the browser itself. You'll probably never guess what these methods do. They click on the back, forward, and refresh keys. Uh, and then, so once you have gone through and navigated through your web app, you'll want to check to make sure it's actually displaying the correct things. So in order to read the text that's on the web page currently, you will have to take that element object that you find and look at its text attribute, or its text uh, member, which is really simple. It's nice and refreshing. So if you have some paragraph uh, element or a div element, you can just look at dot text, and as a string, it'll have uh, the entire content for that page, or for that, for that one element. And if you want to get a particular attribute from that element, say you have a link element, and you want to make sure that it's pointing to the right page, you can take a look at its href uh, attribute, and that'll return a string with the content that it has. If you want to get a list of all of the attributes for an element, you would think you would call get attributes plural, but it turns out that's not the case. In fact, there is no way to get a list of all the attributes. The hack around that is that you get the outer HTML attribute, and then you have to look at, it's, uh, it returns the entire HTML tag and all the content inside of it, and you, I guess you can use regular expressions or some convoluted way. So that's another Selenium weirdness bit. Um, but that's basically it. So yeah, that's, Selenium is actually a surprisingly simple tool. There's not a lot to it. It's just uh, opening the browser, getting element objects using CSS selectors, clicking on things, and then using send keys to type stuff in, and then reading uh, what the text is by checking out its text member variable. That's great. So GUI automation, uh, graphical user interface automation, that sounds really complicated also. It basically just means controlling the mouse and keyboard from, a, from your program. So having a Python script that can move the mouse around on its own. Uh, so for this, I'm gonna cover uh, the PyAuto GUI module, which you can install with kit install PyAuto GUI, and it works on Python 2 and Python 3. It also works on Windows, Linux, and Mac, and it has the same simple API, which is documented on pyautogui.readthedocs.org. So, okay, incoming wall of text, because I just want to slightly cover uh, all the various functions on it, but I'll just glance over this. So, mouse control, uh, yeah, so that's a huge wall of text. Let's do something more fun that will possibly blow up in my face, and that's always entertaining to the audience. And let's do another live demo. So, import PyAuto GUI. Um, first function, position. You want to find out where the mouse cursor is on the screen. So, this right here, 
just returns a simple xy coordinate. These are the same xy coordinates that uh, are commonly used in programming where the origin 0, 0 is in the upper left corner of the screen and x increase is going to the right and y increase is going down. If you want to find out the full size, the resolution of the screen, you can just call size. Um, uh, currently, PyAuto GUI doesn't really work on multi-monitor setups. Well, it kind of works, but its behavior is undefined. That's my favorite euphemism in programming. <laughs> and then say, okay, well, we can just have um, send a click and cause uh, the mouse to click itself wherever it happens to be. So I'm going to position it over this file menu right here, which probably nobody in the back row can see. But when I run that code, it just sends, it automatically sends that virtual mouse click right there. And so say I wanted to figure out, you know, I'm writing some script that's going to automatically test my desktop app. So I need to find, figure out where exactly this file menu is going to be, so I just call position. Okay, it's at 67, 69. And I'll just pass those coordinates to the click function. Now it doesn't matter where the mouse is, it'll just automatically move there and click. So that's kind of nifty. You can just have the mouse move to those coordinates as well with move to. Oh, wait. I'm on automatic. And I'll just instantly zoom the mouse back over there. But if you also just want to mimic kind of what a human does and just have it gradually move over there, you can specify a duration keyword. Let's say, let's move it over there in over the course of two seconds. So starting from here, move back to the file menu and it's moving all on its own. If you're just paying attention to the screen and not noticing that I'm not controlling the mouse, that um, probably doesn't look that fantastic. But here we go. Okay, let's say you don't really care about moving to some absolute coordinates. You just want to move to some relative position, say, you know, 200 pixels to the right, wherever it currently is. So we can just start it right there and it ghostly moves on its own over precisely two seconds. So not quite uh, like a human, because I sort of just like slam the mouse all over the place. But yeah, so you can move the mouse, you can click the mouse. Uh, you can also, there's a drag to and drag rel, which do the exact same thing except hold the mouse button down. Um, if you're trying to plot out your automated test, you're gonna have to run the terminal because this doesn't display correctly in idle. Uh, so there's a function display mouse position, so if you're plotting out what exactly you have to click on in your program, you can just run this function and it provides a handy little tool to figure out where exactly uh, the mouse is at any given time. And it also gives you the RGB color value of whatever pixel is underneath the mouse. So you can see over black it's just zero, 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 and then over this green part the green value shoots up. And I can just exit out of that. And then uh, the keyboard control, also really simple. The main function you'll use there is type right. Let me try this again. Another live demo, another chance for everything to go horrifically wrong. Hello world. Um, oh right, this, so this will send uh, virtual key presses to wherever, uh, whatever text field or window it currently has focus. So I'm gonna just call click to make sure it clicks on this um, before typing. So I'll just move the mouse over this file editor. And when I run that, it instantly types it out. Of course, if you don't want it to be instant, you can just pass this interval keyword argument. And let's say I just want it to pause for a fifth of a second in between each key press. And that, oh, okay, so one error so far in this live demo. Let me position this mouse again. Okay. And it'll just slowly type everything out, hands free. So, you know, kind of like a typewriter effect. Uh, for those of you who don't know, a typewriter is this amazing <laughs> device for putting letters on pieces of paper. And if you just want to press a single key, there's pretty obvious names for them, like the page up key. Just send press a string that says page up. And all of those keys are documented here in the keyboard keys list. Keyboard keys. 
uh, they're all just lowercase and pretty much what you expect, but if you don't get them the first time, you can just look through this list. Uh, and then if you just want to do hotkey combinations, you know, there are in particular like key press down and key press up things to simulate that. But for just doing like a keyboard combination, like I want to type control O to open up the open dialog. I can just say hotkey control and then O. And so here I have idle in focus so that when I press enter, it completely messes up. Whoop. All right, that is two errors so far during all my live demos. Let's see if we can keep it at least in the double digits. Okay, so hey, com I completely did not do that. Hands free, did not press control O. I had the program do it for me. So that's really nice. You can, um, you know, this is like, okay, all these functions, yeah, they have pretty typical names. Uh, that's kind of boring. So let's do another live demo and see what else can go wrong. Okay, I'm gonna close this, and I'm going to open the best thing that's ever come from Microsoft, an S <laughs> And I have this program that will draw out a little square spiral shape. Um, as you can see, it just uses those uh, drag rail to drag the mouse around. I'm just gonna have it drag around here to draw out a little square spiral, so. Make sure that's in focus. I'm going to position the mouse like right about here, and then press F5 to run it. Nice. Keep doing it all day. Take a healthy break. So I mean, well, I mean, this isn't that impressive because there are things like the pill module and pillow, and you can just programmatically generate all of these you know, square spiral shapes that you want, but the nice thing about controlling the mouse to control other programs to do it is that you get to make use of all of uh, MS Paint's many, many abundant features. Um, <laughs> but no, it, it seriously has like, oh, nice little like brushes, like right here, like whoosh, uh, something like that. So now using that exact same program, um, yeah. let me just run this. And now I'm drawing, you know, a square spiral, but it looks a little bit fancier, and reproducing something like that using Pillow would be a non-trivial task. So that's kind of nice. You can actually start writing programs that control other programs, which, of course, is how the robots will take over. <laughs> <laughs> and while I'm on that subject, uh, a slight warning. Uh, so there's this Disney movie, Fantasia, and there's a scene where Mickey Mouse is this sorcerer, uh, and he's given the task to fill up this bathtub full of water so he can chance a broom to do it for him, and this broom is mindlessly carrying out this task in a loop of fill up the bucket, dump it into the tub, but it keeps doing that, even to the point where the tub starts overflowing, and Mickey the Wizard can't really stop this program. And so when you're writing programs that can control the mouse and keyboard, it kind of makes it hard to move the mouse over to stop that program if something is going horrifically wrong. <laughs> so PyAuto GUI has a few fail-safes built in. Uh, one is if uh, at any point you can just slam the mouse up to the top left corner and it detects during any PyAuto GUI call, if it's up there at zero, zero, it'll just raise this fail-safe exception and stop what it's doing. Uh, and also, after every single call, it has a tenth of a second pause at the end of it, so it doesn't run immediately. There's a slight pause there. You can change that if you want. I don't recommend it, but that'll probably buy you enough time to just slam the mouse up and to the left to stop it. So let's do a live, de uh, live demo of that, shall we? Yeah, so let's do a live demo of GUI automation so that it takes away control of the mouse from me of a program that has an infinite loop bug. What could possibly go wrong? Okay, so I'm gonna run this and then slam the mouse up into the left. PyAuto GUI will hopefully detect that and then stop it. Otherwise, um, you're all gonna watch as I pull the battery out of my laptop. <laughs> okay, let's run this. Oh, it's going crazy, I need to stop it. And, okay, hey, okay, yes, just slam the mouse up there. And you see failsafe exception has been raised. So uh, yeah, nice handy little trick to keep your program. This is definitely something that you have to keep in mind when you're writing these automated tasks. The first few times you run that automated test, you might want to babysit it just to make sure it's, you know, not launching missiles at Russia or something like that. <laughs> so 
uh, it's so high audio GUI can control the mouse, can control the keyboard, but it's it's kind of doing this blindly. It's if you imagine a robotic welding arm in a car factory, it's just like weld here, weld here, weld here, and then repeat that over and over again. It doesn't actually know if there's a car in front of it. It just knows I should weld here, weld here, weld here. Same thing with your Pi Auto GUI scripts. It's just click here, click here, click here. Um, that, but that doesn't actually tell it what it's clicking on. So Pi Auto GUI also has a few uh, screenshot and image recognition capabilities. Um, they mostly rely on Pillow, which is installed as a dependency with Pi Auto GUI. But if you're on Linux, you'll also have to install this program, Scrot, to do screenshots. So the first one is a really simple one. It's just pixel, pass it XY coordinates, and I'll return an RGB color value of what the color of that pixel is at that particular coordinate. So if your script is clicking on a gray submit button, you can add a little check to see, you know, is that actually gray right there? So that's a nice, you know, uh, kind of dumb way of, of just having a, a sanity check right there. You can also just take screenshots if, just to have a sort of visual log of what your program is doing and what the screen looks like at any given moment during your program. The main thing that uh, is really nice is it's locate on screen function. So if you have an image of something you want it to click on, you can just pass that to locate on screen and that will return uh, the coordinates for where it found that. So I'm going to do yet another live demo. Let's launch Microsoft's other great application, Calculator, and I already took a screenshot of the 7 key, so this is just its own little PNG file, and I'll just have idle try to find that on the screen. So, hi on GUI dot locate on screen, and then pass it that image file name, uh, calc7key.png. So, uh, two things you should know about this function. One, it's kind of expensive to run. It takes like a full second to actually find, because it's basically checking every pixel on the screen, and there are some ways that you look in the documentation to speed that up a little bit, but you really can't use it for sort of real time, like if uh, you have some video game that's playing and changing the screen really fast, or some movie or animation that's playing, it's not gonna work for that. And also, this has to be an exact pixel-perfect match of the image that you pass it. So if I have that seven key just even slightly uh, overlapped, like right there, that may, oh laptop, why do we always fight in front of groups? Um, <laughs> so if you have that just like slightly covered up, it's not gonna find anything and just return none. Um, oh yes, yeah, so this is just a tuple of four integers. It's just the top and left, it's the, um, the XY coordinates of the top left corner, and then the width and the height of where it found it. But something you'll probably want to use is locate center on screen, and that'll just return the center XY coordinates of that region. So yeah, about a full second to, to run. Uh, what's really nice about this is then you can just pass it to piautogui.click. And that'll just apply it with the x and y coordinates to click on. Bam! Clicked on seven. And so this will click on seven, you know, no matter where this window is on the screen. So nice thing to have as part of your um, GUI automation uh, test. So yeah, what is GUI automation used for? I probably should have put this slide towards the beginning instead of at the end. Um, but, uh, so Selenium is really great at automating browsers and web apps and anything inside that. So GUI automation is great for automating everything else. If you have some desktop application that you need to run, uh, you can use uh, Pi Auto GUI to control the mouse and keyboard. But even inside the browser, if you have something like Flash or an HTML5 canvas and uh, you need to uh, you know, click on somewhere inside of that, you can use Pi Auto GUI to click on something in particular uh, inside the browser that's not an HTML element. But the best thing, I think, for using GUI automation is to write bots that will cheat at flash games. <laughs> so, last and also most ambitious live demo of this entire presentation uh, is this one coming up right next. So, I have, uh, there's this flash game called Sushi Go Round, and it, it, it's like a really 
dumb game like all Flash games are. You have customers that come in and they order sushi and you need to click on all the ingredients and serve them and they're constantly coming in and out and you need to order ingredients as they run low and it takes a lot of practice to get good at this game and I'm not going to do that so I wrote a bot to play it. Uh, this is up on my GitHub um, or you can just Google for sushi go round bot. Uh, so totally automated sushi go round player. Is that it? Okay, yes. Let's see if this actually works. Okay, get everything set up. Sacrifice a chicken behind the podium to appease the gods, and let's go. Totally hands off, it's gonna play this game for us. So it uses image recognition to find where on the screen it is, and I've pre-programmed the locations of all the sushi ingredients so it can detect what, uh, what the customer wants, just send that out. <laughs> Once it starts getting low on supplies, it'll pick up the phone and start ordering all these ingredients. Um, yeah, so there's, it's not perfect. There's a few bugs that come out, and it can sort of get confused at times, but it, it gets a high score that's way higher than anything I've ever gotten playing this game by myself. <laughs> Oh, so I've, I've already taken like screenshots of all the little bits of sushi that are floating above their heads. So it just checks that region for, you know, like, oh, are they ordering this like onigiri sushi or something? It just checks to see which image is floating in that, in that region. Uh, and then it knows, I pre-programmed all the recipes for everything else there. Um, yeah, although I will note that the top players in the high score for this game are, have like double the score of this bot which is really impressive and kind of pathetic also. <laughs> Great, and okay, so when I want to stop this, I can just trigger the fail state by slamming the mouse up and to the left, and that'll stop this out. So cheating at flash games. And that's how you install Selenium and Pyotr GUI. Uh, the book, again, is Automate the Boring Stuff with Python that you can read for free online. Uh, there's my Twitter. Tweet at me if you want to hang out. I'm in Austin until Monday. Thank you very much.